back everyone for our first panel of the conference and um, we're going to have each of the panelists speak. Uh, Carmen Belmonte, who is professor of humanities at Roma Tre, is going to do the introductions and chair the panel. We are waiting on John Torpy, who was supposed to land at 12.30. So he may run in and, and give his talk. Uh, so everyone keep your fingers crossed for that. So thank you, Carmen. Good afternoon. I'm uh, really glad to be back uh, here at the American Academy. And thank you, Marla, for involving me. Um, glad to moderate this uh, panel exploring uh, contemporary struggles over uh, race, gender, and citizenship. I introduce uh, the first speaker, Angelica Pesarini. Uh, she's an assistant professor at the University of Toronto and works uh, on the intersections of race, gender, citizenship, and uh, identity in Italy. Pesarini's research and publications explore the dynamics of race performativity with a main interest on the racialization of the Italian political discourse on immigration. She is also very active in the anti-racist debates in Italy and is a member of the Black Mediterranean Collective. Angelica, the floor is yours. Buon pomeriggio. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Okay. So uh, before I start, I also wanted to thank Marla for this invitation. It's so nice to be back in my city, Rome. But also, it's so nice to be among you and hearing all these uh, very inspiring uh, talks and conversations. So thank you so much for this. Uh, I'm presenting this paper today that is still work in progress. So. Yes, it would be nice in the Q&A to have some feedback or questions about it. So, um, the election for the renewal of Italian Parliament on September 25th certainly marked a new phase in the Italian um, political landscape. The winning center-right coalition headed by Giorgia Meloni, Matteo Salvini and Silvio Berlusconi has enshrined the rise of the party led by Meloni, Fratelli d'Italia, a political formation that carries with it ideals of a post-fascist, conservative, nationalist and Christian right wing. Meloni becomes not only the president uh, of the Council of Ministers, but also the first woman in the history of the Republic to hold this office. The dimensions of race, gender, and blood present in Meloni's political discourse are remarkable and have certainly contributed to the uh, success of Fratelli d'Italia. Without ever making explicit references to race, but through the use of biopolitics grounded in a certain biological and gender identity of women, Meloni succeeds, uh, succeeds in reclaiming the whiteness of Italy and Italians through common belonging to an identity defined and transmitted by blood. These discursive maneuvers are situated within a rigid heteropatriarchal and heteronormative framework in which the traditional family and thus gender binarism and heterosexual parenting play a key role. Meloni also adds a firm reminder of the Christian roots of Italy and Europe and expresses clear opposition not only to the arrival and stay in Italy of irregular immigrants, but also to any change in the law for the transmission of citizenship, civil unions, adoption for uh, <clears throat> non-heterosexual parents, uh, and sex education in schools. <clears throat> 
So the use of biopolitics based on gender, race, identity, nexus is certainly not new in the Italian political discourse. So starting from these results, uh, today I will focus on the analysis of some case studies ranging from the end of Matteo Renzi's government in 2016 to the campaign that took place between summer 2017 and the spring of 2018, and the results of the past elections in 2018. The analysis aims to highlight the strategic use of certain biopolitics put into practice by seemingly opposing political forces, the genealogy of which can be traced back to fascist policies on reproduction, which sees the family as the cornerstone of the nation and procreation as a patriotic act entrusted by women. Um, I will make reference to Foucault's idea of biopolitics and biopower, but this will be reinforced by the use of feminist theoretical work produced by uh, Nira Yuval Davis and Floya Antias to highlight how the construction of the nation and national identity pass through the political use of biological functions understood as signifiers filled with specific ideologies. Finally, the article offers a reflection on biopolitics and necropolitics. So, um, so in her study on racism and the social management of reproduction in Brazil, Valeria Ribeiro Corocas states something fundamental. In a sense, she writes, in the maternity ward, one can observe the nation reproducing itself. This statement encapsulates how human reproduction is not simply a biological fact, but rather represents the foundation of any concrete project of a nation in which reproduction and motherhood is taken care by state health facilities. Women's and men's bodies, in addition to being organic matter are also powerful symbolic, political, and cultural terrain whereby sexual activities are shaped by certain power relation and specific knowledge. In the heteronormative and heteropatriarchal context, women's bodies and their reproductive capacities play a key role. Historically, this has involved particular scrutiny and surveillance of their behavior by the state. Yuval Davis theorizes the importance of women's reproductive capacities within ethno-nationalist discourses, since it is through birth, she tells us, that one becomes part of a nation collectivity. The connection between women as both biological reproducer of the nation and at the same time bearers of collectivity is particularly relevant in the Italian political discourse, whereby Italianness and therefore normality passes through the womb and is inherited by blood. The genealogy of this discourse can be traced within the fascist period. In this period, in fact, through a series of legal measures, we see the politicization of life by the state applied, what Foucault would call the biopolitics of the population. So what does it mean? The calculating management of life is functional to the maintenance of power that sees the body and its discipline as its highest pillar. Subordination of bodies and control of the population is achieved through the exercise of biopower, which by serving legal measure and control devices, disciplines, regulates and sanctions. The device of sexuality in particular uh, will constitute one of the greatest technologies of the 19th century. Examining the Italian context, we can observe an application of biopower during the fascist regime when, beginning in 1925, legal measures and control devices for the management of life were put in place. And this, uh, by Putting, by placing extraordinary attention on the body of the Italian woman, understood as white, heterosexual, and Christian. Um, the application of 
uh, biopower uh, over the body is manifested through the normalization of certain acts and behaviors and punished uh, and the punishment of practices considered ab abnormal. In this regard, in 1930, the regime introduced a new penal code signed by Alfredo Rocco containing new legal measures and crime. This included the development of the crime of procurato aborto, procured abortion. The termination of pregnancies by women posed, oh, sorry, posed major challenges to fascist biopolitics. So it was considered a particular serious crime included in the new categories of crime against the integrity and health of the lineage and along with other crimes against procreation. Women's lives were regulated by the state, which granted men, in a state of rage, the, key, the right to kill women whose honor had to be defended. In 1925, with the creation of Opera Nazionale per la Maternità e l'Infanzia, a clear link between reproductive policies and the development and improvement of the race entrusted to women is made explicit. The ONMI, which began as a state agency, entrusted with programs and activities to support mothers and children in need, and turned out to be a device to control women and their sexuality in order to manage the population. Biopolitics, however, didn't seem to bear the desired uh, fruit. Not only a, small, a very small number of women benefited from Omni's assistance, but birth uh, rate didn't increase. Actually, quite the contrary. Um, so how is this related to contemporary Italy? In his speech at the Partito Democratico National Assembly in May 2017, Matteo Renzi announced the creation of 40 new departments in the party executive to strengthen the party ahead of elections the following year. Prominent among them was a departed uh, given to Titti Di Salvo and called Il Dipartimento delle Mamme, Mom's Department, whose purpose was to support fertility and procreation. The department was in line with the PDE priorities at the time, work, housing, and mothers, defined by Renzi, the, great, uh, the greatest political issue of our time. On social media, the idea obviously raised a lot of criticism, uh, described by some as a cultural regression. The mom's department proved problematic in many ways. Not only he suggests an essentialization of the category woman, considered exclusively from a biological perspective, but it also implies an overlap between women and mothers, thus flattening individuality at the expense of the reproductive function. Moreover, the department seemed to place itself in a strictly heteronormative and heteropatriarchal context that considered only people with a neutrals and heterosexual as mothers, excluding other categories. In this context, the responsibility for the birth issues seemed to fall on women who, according to Renzi, consider motherhood a problem to their careers and therefore they don't have children. In his speech, though, Renzi seemed not to question the cultural, economic, social, and institutional reason that forced some to become mother because also the non-enforcement of law um, 194, or why mother in the so-called traditional family bear more responsibility than men. The connection between women as the nation's cultural and biological reproducer and their bodies understood as a procreat procreative machines to be protected had already emerged the year before, during Renzi's government, when the Ministry of Health, um, Beatrice Lorenzin, carried out a campaign on fertility and health. The ministry drafts a, uh, drafted a national fertility plan titled Defend Your Fertility, Prepare for a Cradle in Your Future. The document outlined and developed five points through which fertility was supported, points that seem to reflect not only ideals of femininity and motherhood, but clearly operated this overlap between women's bodies and the nation's bodies. 
Uh, in point number four, the plan proposed to, and I quote, operate a reversal of the current mindset aimed towards fertility as an essential need, not only for couples, but society as a whole, promoting a cultural renewal on the subject of procreation. Point five aimed to celebrate this cultural revolution by establishing Fertility Day, where the key word will be to discover the prestige of motherhood. Therefore, motherhood is uh, spoken uh, in terms of prestige, a word very dear to the fascist vocabulary, and the celebration of fertility is declared through the design of an oct day called precisely Fertility Day. And so here you can see, uh, yes, the language and the, <laughs> and the content of the campaign show some legacies from the uh, vocabulary of fascist biopolitics on natality and procreation. And from a communication media point of view, uh, the project will prove to be a disaster. The images receive so much criticism that even Renzi said this campaign is unwatchable, uh, inguardabile. This image in particular, obviously, um, well, obviously for us maybe, uh, raised a lot of criticism. <laughs> And um, the images were removed. But the ministry, uh, they were also uh, on the social media really liked the counter images, as you can see. Uh, this one in particular, I think, is quite, is quite nice. Um, so uh, these images were removed. And in September, uh, the ministry, Lorenzine, try again, by publishing a series of informal pamphlets. Um, this campaign also, this new campaign, turned out to be a communication disaster and also this campaign will be uh, removed because uh, blamed to be blatantly racist. So, as you can see, uh, so this was to promote good life uh, style health style uh, and so you can you can see this image right uh, on the on the on the top we see this very aryan uh, family friends and uh, on the bottom we see we perceive some uh, curly hair people smoking uh, so there were some racial racial component um, to the extent that uh, online uh, the um, Eritrean-born Milanese activist uh, at the Stesfamarium decided to respond to this campaign, which she called defamatory towards Afro-descendant people in Italy. Uh, she posted a, a video uh, on the social media explaining to Minister Lorenzin why the image is offensive and racist, and she posted this image uh, saying that uh, in, in the Netherlands, uh, they chose her face and her hair to represent the university, while in Italy the same hair and the same skin tone was seen as abnormal uh, way of living. To the accusation of racism, Ministry Lorenzine responded in an embarrassing manner, as if the whole affair was not embarrassing enough. Uh, not only does the minister deny any form of racism, on the contrary, she accused of racism the people calling this campaign racist by saying, a uh, very dear uh, uh, response that I hear very often in Italy, Racismo, uh, uh, racism is in the eyes of the beholder. We think about prevention. These photos represent a homogeneity of people, just as multi-ethnic as Italian society is. Uh, however, to me, these images were a bit disturbing because they had some clear resemblance to the defense of the race uh, cover, um, published in 1938. So where the purpose is to make a symbolic and physical separation between whites, representative of Italia, of the Italic race, blacks, and Jews. To make matters worse, it would, um, sorry, um, what 
made all of this even more embarrassing is that we discovered that these images were in reality taken from a stock. So this was the real nature of the images. One was a dental clinic, that's why these beautiful smiles, and the other one was a, not that I think, yeah, uh, why do people start taking drugs? Mm. So it was, yes, uh, it was quite uh, uh, shocking. Um, so this was also uh, um, some counter uh, images. But I, I would like to compare this to something that happened in 2018. Just a little step back. Summer of 2017 informally marked the beginning of the electoral campaign that will culminate in March 2018 election. Um, although, and reform of citizenship became one of the most heated topics. Although debates regarding possible reform have been going on for nearly two decades, a final compromise has yet to be reached. The numerous attempts to promote a change in the law came to fruition in 2011, when 20 associations launched a campaign called L'Italia Son Anch'io, supported also by the newspaper uh, Repub La Repubblica. The campaign was very successful. They managed to collect 200,000 signatures. And on February 5th, 2012, a text of popular initiative was submitted to the Chamber of Deputies. Unfortunately, when the vote goes to the Senate, the um, vote is postponed by, for almost two years because of nearly 50,000 amendments proposed by Lega and Fratelli d'Italia. And so we have to wait until June 2017 when the government, led by Paolo Gentiloni, brings the bill uh, to the Senate despite not having been previously scheduled. The debate uh, became so heated that the Minister of Education of the time, Valeria Fedeli, was injured following a series of uh, altercation caused by some Liga senators who tried to, re to reach the front of the benches with a sign saying, no, you solely stop the invasion. In the days following this uh, argument in the Senate, um, the Senator Ignazio Benito Maria La Russa uh, used to go in many shows. I don't know if you remember that. And in the various program he was going, he was expressing his opposition to the bill, reiterating on multiple occasions one particular statement. Uh, L'Italia non può diventare la sala parto dell'Africa. Italy cannot become the delivery room of Africa. Uh, so what he was saying is they come here, they give birth to their children, and they find someone to pose as the father in order to scrounge the generosity of Italian citizenship. If, if we change the citizenship law, this is what is going to happen. Um, so there was a case that kind of struck me uh, on this time, thinking about La, Russa, La Russa's uh, words. And, uh, it was the case of beauty. Uh, her surname was never uh, given uh, in the newspapers. Beauty, uh, who arrived uh, in Italy in uh, 2008 and lived with her husband, Destiny, in Naples. She was uh, suffering of a terminal disease. And so the, uh, when, uh, during the latest months of the pregnancy, she decided to go to France, where her sister lived, in order to uh, benefit a more stable situation ahead of the birth. Although Beauty has a residence permit that allowed her to move, her husband, Destiny, has an expired residence permit. On February 9th, they attempt to cross the border into France by coach, but they're stopped by French gendarmes. Beauty, uh, who could have continued the journey alone, decided to stay with Destiny, and around 2 a.m., they are both taken back in Italy to the Bardonecchia train station, where it was snowing at the time and the temperature was minus 8. Beauty was in her seventh month of pregnancy, has severe abdominal pain, and despite her advanced state of pregnancy and severe respiratory uh, problem caused by the illness, she was still left in the station in Bardonecchia. 
Here, around 2 a.m., a local NGO take the couple to the hospital and tra um, beauty is transferred to um, the hospital in Torino, Sant'Anna. Given beauty's determination to save the fetus, doctors begin an, an experimental phase of chemo chemotherapy. <coughs> Nevertheless, a month later, during her 29th week of pregnancy, she gave birth to a 700 gram uh, fetus by emergency C-section and she died shortly after. So yes, uh, Italy offered a delivery room to this African woman, but from that room she never came out. And um, the fact that Italy offered beauty a delivery room, allowing her to produce life, life, show at the same time the lack of value placed on that life, forcing her to give birth in the restrictive, dangerous, and in this case, lethal condition posed by the Italian state and its laws. This regulation of peoples and spaces has consequences on people's life and is capable of causing their death. And as Elizabeth Povinelli argues, neoliberal states are defined in their violence and ability to cause harm, pain and death at the expenses uh, of a certain part of the population. They are seen as chips in a fortuitous poker game in which the social aspect is seen as an impediment to production. If the purpose of biopolitics consists in the wider reproduction of life, which translates into the protection of a certain life procreated by certain bodies, the case of beauty forces us to, forces us to reflect on the necropolitics that, that is the politic of death enacted by, uh, in Europe. Racism plays a central role in these policies since the politics of race are closely connected to the politics of death. Ashi and Bembe draws important connections between racism and biopower, since biopower manifests itself through a division and selection of population between those who should live and those who should die. As he points out, this power applies in the biological sphere, a sphere in which biopower assumes control by investing itself with the right to decide. The making decision power also manifests itself in neoliberal practices of exclusion and exploitation against immigrants and asylum seekers who dare to cross fortress Europe, producing what Ruthie Gilmore calls the vulnerability to premature death of some groups. So I think my time is uh, almost finished. I, all of these facts were happening between 2016 and 2018. Uh, Italy recently elected uh, Giorgio Meloni as a prime minister. And I just would like to uh, show you a, bit, a little clip. Le nostre scelte possiamo aiutare il paese e l'ambiente risparmiando perché la consapevolezza dell'importanza del proprio impegno in questo momento. L'energia più grande. C'è bisogno dell'energia di tutti. Terna Driving Energy. Adesso chiaramente riparlano di togliere la dicitura padre e madre dai documenti. Perché la famiglia è un nemico. L'identità nazionale è un nemico. L'identità di genere è un nemico. Tutto quello che ci definisce per loro è un nemico. È il gioco del pensiero unico. Ci devono togliere tutto quello che siamo perché quando non avremo più un'identità e non avremo più radici noi saremo privi di consapevolezza, incapaci di difendere i nostri diritti. È il loro gioco.
vogliono che siamo genitore 1, genitore 2, genere LGBT, eh, eh, cittadini X, dei codici. Ma noi non siamo dei codici, noi siamo persone e difenderemo la nostra identità. Io sono Giorgia, sono una donna, sono una madre, sono italiana, sono cristiana, non me lo toglierete, non me lo toglierete. So, it is now, it will now be necessary to pay attention to these words that make make up these discourses which are steeped in references to a past that saw women's bodies and their reproductive function and their rights as property to be managed and manipulated. And will, it will be necessary to know how to act in case these words are used for the legitimization of control mechanism aimed at the progressive limitation of rights and freedom. Thank you. Thank you, Angelica, for this uh, wonderful paper. Uh, we will have a discussion uh, at the end of the third presentation. Uh, so now uh, I present, I introduce uh, the second speaker, Silvana Patriarca. He's professor of history at Foreign University. She specializes in uh, social cultural, cultural history of modern Italy from the Risorgimento to the present. Now, she is currently focusing on the history of nationalism and racism in connection with the construction of Italian and uh, European identities. She recently published uh, the book uh, Il Colore della Repubblica, translated in English as uh, Race in Post-Fascist Italy. Today, she presents a, pa uh, a paper entitled uh, The Unsustainable Imaginary of the White Nation in Contemporary Italy. So uh, I'd like to thank, first of all, Marla Stone, Aliza Wong, and Mark Robbins uh, for the invitation to speak here, and the American Academy in Rome for this grand uh, hospitality. I mean, Villa Aurelia, so that's quite, quite a treat. So I'm glad to have this opportunity to be uh, with a group of scholars uh, who share similar preoccupations uh, uh, as well as research objects. Uh, Italy is my first country and the U.S. is my second one. And in spite of their uh, very great differences, they have much in common right now with regard to the politics of citizenship and identity. Mm -hmm. So I'll be addressing the theme of the conference on the basis of my background as a historian of Italian nationalism and racism. Uh, 21st century Italy is a multi-ethnic country which most of its political elites and their voters uh, still imagine along the lines of 19th and 20th century Italian nationalism, namely as a European white nation. For decades now, nativist and right-wing parties have been feeding and capitalizing politically on the idea of a homogeneous people that has never really existed. In fact, the inhabitants of the peninsula have always, since classical antiquity at least, been ethnically mixed. The post-fascist party leading the current government coalition calls itself Brothers of Italy, the opening line of the national anthem, originally composed in 1847 during the Risorgimento, the struggle for national independence and unification. So the imaginary couldn't be more retro than this. And consider also that we get uh, this appropriation, of course, of the national anthem by uh, the fascist uh, of the Repubblica di Salò in 44. And Italy has been fully renationalized uh, since the 1990s. Although today's Italy needs more immigrants to offset its very low birth rate, immigration continues to be treated as an emergency, represented on the right, especially as an invasion, and as Stephanie already reminded us this morning, large amounts of money are spent in the futile 
and cruel attempt to keep migrants and asylum seekers from Africa and in Asia out of the country. For decades now, they've also been criminalized, marginalized, and contrasted to the true Italian. You may recall the uh, Prima gli Italiani slogan, uh, with uh, which Matteo Salvini, uh, the demagogue uh, leader of the League, uh, formerly Northern League, borrowed from a neo-fascist formation called Forza Nuova to run a successful campaign in the Italian elections of 2018. That election brought uh, its right-wing populist party to the national government in coalition with another populist party called Movimento Cinque Stelle, which represented a different brand of populism. Although with much fewer voters, today the party of Salvini is back in power with the Brothers of Italy party, which uh, you may not know, but uh, maybe some of you do not know, but it was founded in 2012 by post-fascists who did not want to merge uh, with the Berlusconi party. So these are the sort of extreme right wing of the post-fascist party that existed before called the Alleanza Nazionale. Both of the uh, League and Brothers of Italy are nativist parties bent on preserving so-called Italianess. They understand Italianess not only in cultural terms, but also in ethno-racial terms. Until recently, race was not mentioned explicitly uh, when speaking of Italian identity, but for a few years now, even in this post, uh, this post Holocaust taboo has been on its way out as we increasingly hear paranoid talk of immigration as an attempt to uh, uh, ethnically substituting the Italians. And so another conspiracy theories of this kind, which originally were peddled by the lunatic fringe and now are becoming more mainstream. Race, however, does not need to be mentioned. It's simplicity in the way historically the Italian people and Italianists have been constructed. And this is the unsaid of much current talk about identity. Uh, due to a citizenship, lo citizenship law mainly based on youth sanguinis and on a discriminat discriminatory naturalization process full of hurdles, there are more than five million residents in Italy who are not Italian citizens because they have originated from other countries and have not been naturalized, including their children born here. There are almost a million children born in Italy from non-Italian citizens or brought to Italy at a very early age who do not have Italian citizenship. Often they happen to be, to have a dark skin. Non ci sono italiani negri, uh, that was, uh, there are no black Italians, uh, Italians are black, is a slogan that has not often been seen in stadiums, uh, heard in stadiums, uh, at soccer games, uh, among the racist fans of various Italian clubs. And now it appears also in, uh, in anti-racist uh, demonstration by those who are contesting anti-racism. So this was actually, sorry, it's not, it's not moving. I was just uh, looking here. Okay, right. So this was actually shown at a school, at a secondary high school in Pistoia. Uh, so by by a student who protested against uh, uh, an anti-racist uh, um, uh, event that had been organized. So um, white first, uh, that's what most people hear when uh, uh, the nativists shout uh, uh, Italians first. In my talk, I want to uh, make three, three main points. Uh, the first concern, the deep roots uh, of the ethno-racial idea of Italianess, uh, which we can trace back to the 19th century. And I must underline that this is a view uh, that is still contested by some in the historical profession who cling to the idea uh, that 19th century Italian nationalism uh, or patriotism uh, was not ethnic but civic. Uh, the second point is the legacy of the ethno-racial idea of Italian identity in post-fascist Italy, uh, in which officially rejected races continue to circulate uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, 
And I will in cons consider in particular the case of the brown babies uh, born in Italy at the end of the Second World War, uh, and then move to the passage of the new citizenship law of 1992, which took place in a context of increased immigration and demographic worries about the fall of the birth rate, uh, leading to the, rep to the reappearance of a pro-natalist discourse in Italy, both on the left and on the right. Finally, I will underline the importance of changing this piece of leg legislation, but also the insufficiency of such a change if the imagining of the nation does not change substantially. So starting with Italian Risorgimento, so I'm sort of constructing a, genealo a genealogy that goes back to the, to the origins, essentially, of Italian nationalism. Uh, so the Italian Risorgimento constituted the beginning of a national raciology, uh, to use the expression of Paul Gilroy, namely of a discourse on race that makes a people into a race uh, with uh, purposes of political legitimation. Italianists acquired then, for the first time, a political significance. Various discourses were mobilized to define and delimit the Italians from other people and thus establish, uh, establish on solid, natural, and even scientific basis their claim and right to statehood. How can one distinguish them from other peoples? Do they have unique characteristics? What are the traits, qualities that could make the inhabitants of the peninsula into a distinct group? Patriotic writers, Catholic but also anti-clerical ones, underline the presence of one language, one religion, common memories, the same blood and feelings. Uh, the author of the most popular tract of, the, of that period, Vincenzo Gioberti, stressed the Italian stirpe stock uh, adding common blood, religion, written language, even though the Italians did not share the same government, laws, popular languages, and habits. Uh, besides a reference to stock and blood, in other words, to the idea of lineage, which is what a way of constructing race, the racial construction of the Italian people took place also in the discourse of the uh, emerging ethnographic and geographic sciences engaged in the work of defining the Italian people in scientific terms. Already in the 1850s, the anthropologist Giustiniano Nicolucci, sorry. So Giustiniano Nicolucci introduced Arianism in Italy, speaking of an Aryan race as a permanent variety of the human species, and including the Italians in it, as part of a the so-called Pelagic family. Uh, culture, skulls, and bones were used to define, together to define Italianness. National raciology got a greater impulse in the period of the liberal state. To be sure, the constitution of the new state inherited from the kingdom of Sardinia Piedmont did not refer to race and not even to nation. But the civil code already enshrined use sanguinis, the right of blood, as the fundamental criterion for the attribution of citizenship. Moreover, Italian high culture made plenty of use of the term stirpe, stock, which conveys the idea of the Italian as a kin group with a common ancestor, disregarding the fact that the inhabitants of the peninsula, of course, originated from different places at different times. Indeed, race played a vital part in the social construction of Italianness in the years of the liberal state, during the late 19th century, for example, the notion of national character acquired a racial inflection as the alleged qualities and defects of the Italian people were seen as rooted in their very physical and racial being. Physical appearance, race, and moral and civil qualities came to be connected in that notion which is, by the way, still very present today, and it's one of the ways in which you uh, continue to reproduce the idea of uniqueness. So, to be sure, some anthropologists identified two races, a Nordic and a Mediterranean one, among the ina inhabitants of the Italian peninsula, and racialized the southern question. Yet, in front of the colonized people, these differences became less salient. The whitening of the southern population, which Gaia Giuliani and Cristina Lombardi Diop see as realized with the proclamation of the empire in 1936, already began with the creation of the Eritrean colony in 1890, 
and with the emphasis on Romance and on Romanità, that developed at the turn of the 20th century, especially. I mean, it was not unknown before, but of course there is a very strong emphasis on that notion at the beginning of the 20th century among the new nationalists, the most aggressive brand of nationalists who wanted to conquer uh, Libya. Uh, and while the, the naturalization of foreigners was very rare, the citizenship law passed in 1912 reaffir reaffirmed uh, the role of youth sanguinis mixed with youth solely in a subordinate position in defining who was an Italian, making the recovery of citizenship very easy for Italian migrants, so that's the period of maximum Italian migration outside of Italy, who had been naturalized in other countries. Naturalized in other countries, but it was essentially mandatory to be naturalized, right? So politics of immigration in countries of immigration. Thus, it should not come as a surprise that the 1921 program of the National Fascist Party referred to the Italian people as a stock. And it's the first time that we see it right, in, in a program of a party, uh, a term which was interchangeable with race. Under fascism, the equivalence between race and nation was asserted in the demographic and hygienic policies of the regime aim, aimed at strengthening the Italian race. And on this, uh, Angelica has already, has already covered this. In, uh, in the fascist regime also, the discourse on Italianness became an even more grotesquely exaggerated series of claims about the superior qualities of the race, uh, mixed with complaints about the defect of a character that was also difficult to modify because right, the regime wanted to make the Italians more militaristic, more militarized, and more disciplined. As the regime struck its alliance with the Catholic Church, eliminating the separation between church and state, Italianists came to be identified with what had been enshrined in the Concordat as state religion. Thus, the, it the Italian was Aryan, uh, white, and Catholic at a certain point by the end of the 30s. Um, under fascism, racism became fully institutionalized in the colony to ensure not only that the Italians would enjoy a privileged position vis-a-vis -vis -vis the indigenous population, but would also preserve so-called racial purity. This led to the criminalization of interracial unions in 1937 and to the exclusion of the mixed race from Italian citizenship in 1940. Building on previous ideas about the defective nature of the offsprings of Italian Union, fascist propaganda offered visual images conveying the idea. Uh, this is from the Difesa della Razza, the official organ of the Italian, uh, of uh, it, the, the campaign, uh, racial, the racist campaign of fascism. Soon after, institutionalized racism hit Italians of Jewish background. Officially made into a race, Italian Jews became the victim of what uh, uh, anthropologist Arjun Apardurai calls a predatory identity, meaning an identity that claims the need for the elimination of approximate collectivity defined as a threat to us. The official organ of the fascist, of fascist racism spoke of the very tiny Jewish minority in terms of a Judaic invasion which would cause the adulteration of the race and of popular genius. It spoke of the death of Italy caused by this invasion. Of course, remember, it, it was one-tenth of one percent, the uh, Jewish population of Italy, and projected onto Jews their own racism, calling them the biggest racist. The paranoid claims about Jews served to justify the vicious measures of discrimination and expropriation that hit uh, Jewish Italians. With the collapse of fascism, institutionalized racism ended in the sense that the constitution, the new constitution declared that uh, there should be no discrimination on the basis of race. But Italianists continue to be uh, implicit and then also in the citizenship law understood in somatic racial terms while the racist legislation was abrogated, race thinking was not subjected to any sustained criticism. After 1945, scholars who professed not just racial but racist beliefs continued to be present in academia and in the Italian scientific community. 
And while race was no longer inscribed in population registers or identity papers, the press and administrative documents of the period show that the cattery continued to be regularly employed. I want to mention here the case I know best for that period, namely uh, that of the children born from the encounters of non-white allied soldiers and Italian white women. Children who were regularly referred as the mulattini, um, who um, were, uh, so, you know, um, suffered this, the, uh, from the stigma of illegitimacy because they were mostly born from uh, women who uh, did not have, uh, right, were not in a wedlock, were not in a, uh, a marriage with uh, the soldiers, the African-American soldiers, and also from women who had been uh, raped. But uh, they were suffering also from the fact of having uh, features different than the somatic norm. So they were known in the US as brown babies. In the early 1950s, a powerful priest from Milan, you see him here, Don Gnocchi, collected a few of these children in one of his children's homes uh, and came up with the idea that for their own good, of course, uh, they should be sent away to a country such as Brazil, for example, where they would not stand out and could live among a similarly mixed race population. He didn't like very much the United States because we're a Protestant country, so uh, they would be more safe from, from that point of view uh, in South America. In spite of their small number, the presence of these children exposed the persistence of ideas of racial difference and generated fears of racial contamination. Former fascists claimed that the Allied had tried to alter uh, out of spite the whiteness of the native population by bringing to the peninsula a vast number of non-white troops who impregnated Italian women. Still in the late 50s, there were doctors who commented favorably about the booming birth rate among the Italians, among the native Italians, because it was going to cancel the traces of the alien race introduced by these interracial sexual encounters. However, there was no need uh, to use an explicitly racial language, as other studies of racism in post-45 democratic Europe demonstrate, exclusion does not need to rely on explicitly racist criteria. One can just uh, use the national origin category and the establishment of the EU in the early 1990s 1990s offer a perfect excuse in that sense. That's exactly when the Italian government introduced a reform of the citizenship law. At that time, Italy was still governed by a coalition of centrist parties. And the Christian Dem Democrat, Giulio Andreotti, whom I'm sure you have heard of, uh, was prime minister. Uh, the term reform of the citizenship law is a misnomer because the new law while introducing some progressive changes in terms of gender, meaning ratifying a, 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 um, a court, a constitutional court uh, uh, um, rule that had already been introduced before, so giving the same right of uh, transmitting citizenship to women, um, while introducing these, these uh, changes, it strengthened uh, youth sanguinis because it made it easier for members of the Italian diaspora to acquire or reacquire Italian citizenship, and at the same time, more difficult for residents originating from a non-European, non-EU country and their children to do the same. So this was not by chance. In the previous 10, 15 years, the number of immigrants from the global south has started to grow and Italians had begun to show hostility to this immigrant population. The presenter of the law of 1992 underlined its positive aspects for the diaspora and for the uh, EU citizen, and avoided mentioning explicitly the rationale for making it more difficult for the so-called extra comunitari, a code word to indicate non-white immigrants. During the debate, the deputies of the left did not raise any objections to the different treatment reserved, or almost any objection, there was one objection, to the different treatment reserved to non-EU uh, residents. Uh, 
which, by the way, keep, keep in mind that, that was not, uh, there was not such a um, discriminatory provision in the law of 1912. Uh, but now there was, limiting their uh, remarks to some generalities on how in the present national epoch, uh, national citizens should be overcome, which is a splendid, uh, you know, uh, reference to what they were not doing, but not even uh, really talking about. In contrast, the representatives of the neo-fascist right in parliament at the time, which was called the Italian uh, social movement, and no problem stating that they favored the differential treatment as necessary to stem the invasion from non-European countries, their language. Uh, but that language, if one goes in looking for it, was not absent even in the more centrist quarters. In 1987, in an official report to the lower house, uh, the Ministry of Health, the Christian Democrat Carlo Donat Catan, while denouncing the use of abortion as a means of birth control, underlined the need to support the birth rate and warned against the self-annihilation, his word, self-annihilation of the Italian ethnicity that was being predicted to happen in about a century. He also had added that if the trend continued, Italians were destined to be replaced by immigrant originating uh, in large number from the southern shore of the Mediterranean. So the specter of darker Italy was not so subtly evoked. Since then, anti-immigration parties have been decrying migration from non-European countries in the same terms as the fascist ra races spoke of the tiny Jewish minority as an invasion. Neo-fascist and nativists speak in, sem in similar paranoid terms of the death of Italy and of ethnic sub substitution. And as already uh, we have seen, they, they are trying to um, urge Italian white women to make more children. And I want to show you another post that complements the one that, that Angelica showed you before. This is very, very retro. This is fascist uh, uh, propaganda, so uh, borrowed by Forza Nuova, which is an extreme right-wing party which reproduces the image of a woman by breastfeeding an infant. So totally um, borrowed from that period. When center-left governments address the same issue, at times similar imagery comes to the surface. Uh, and you have seen the cover before again from uh, Angelica showed you this one. So this one has been commented. So there is a similarity here again about divisions. Uh, which must be, right, must be poor, uh, I don't know, <laughs> right, uh, a, va a vast uh, ignorance because these were supposedly people who were working on, uh, on, the, on the center left, right? So in terms of imaginary, it remains the same. So, um, so far the attempts to, to uh, reform the citizenship law have failed despite the demands of the organization uh, mentioned again by already by Angelica, organizations of immigrate of immigrants and black Italians and their allies. Uh, the this is the campaign L'Italia sono anch'io, I'm Italy too, which was launched by the Rete G2, the network of second generations in 2011. Uh, and of course, this reform for now, unless the government falls and there is really some kind of radical change, uh, we cannot we cannot imagine this being done anytime soon. The fact that the center-left opposition does not pursue this fight with the necessary conviction and sense of urgency is due not only to political social, and socioeconomic reasons. Immigration is a toxic topic in politics and citizenship reform is not a priority even among the electorates of the left. But also to an imagining of the nation that in various ways is shared, right? I think that this is also the other thing, this imagining of the nation that is shared across the political spectrum. So the population of Italy has been declining for several years now. According to the Central Statistical Office, births have decreased by 30% between 2008 and 2021, also showing that this kind of pro-Natalist campaigns are not really working. Uh, and it should be evident how unsustainable the imagining of the homogeneous nations uh, is in the context of one of the lowest birth rates on earth. 
And indeed, this is one of the arguments used by anti-racist and advocates of immigration. But this kind of ration, a rational, sort of rational argument doesn't seem to have much of an influence on public opinion. Other tools are necessary to fight this battle, tools that can have an impact uh, uh, at an emotional level and on the imagine, imagination of people. There are many Italian novelists and writers of non-European origins who are increasingly challenging the ethno-racial construction of the Italian people and giving Italy a different mirrors in which to look at itself. And I want to, re to uh, uh, recall here in particular the work of, and the writings of Marilena Umo Auzadelli, Ijaba Shego, Nadisha Uyangoda, among others, who, are, who have engaged, are engaged in a fundamental work of education of the, right, uh, of the white Italian public, calling them to confront the racism. In novels and personal testimonies, memoirs and autobiographies, these writers have been producing a new picture of Italy, uh, have been rewriting the nation, to use the expression of Caterina Romeo, highlighting its many colors. Without exaggerating the power of narratives to Im impact emotional attitudes and engender change, and without wanting to impose a single identity on the authors of these works, I'd like to stress the importance of this literature. Before becoming a political reality in the 19th century, Italy existed in the imagination of writers, was evoked and given life in poems and novels, in parallel, what literary scholars call the literature of migration, or also post-colonial literature, gives voice to a new Italy, a multicultural and multi-ethnic one that wants to be recognized and respected. So to conclude, uh, the old imaginary of uh, the country is unsustainable, not just because Italy needs immigrants and their children for socioeconomic reasons, reasons that may be disputable, but because it invisibilizes so many of the very people on which its future depends. It is out of respect for the dignity of these Italians, as well as the principle of equality uh, inscribed in the Constitution that the current citizenship law must be changed. But a change in legislation, while indispensable, will not be enough unless there is also a change in perceptions and self-representations. In other words, unless the nation is imagined in new ways. So let me conclude with the words of a member of the Rete G2, collected by Camilla Hawthorne in her, in, uh, um, among the, the material that uh, she was collecting for her book that came out last year. This was collected in 2014. I'm quoting, open quote, Citizenship is the main objective, but we have also to work on the image that Italy has of itself. Italy is only ever represented as white and Catholic. Changing the law also means putting this model into crisis. Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, brilliant insight uh, in the imaginary of uh, contemporary Italy. Uh, now, now I present uh, the third speaker, uh, Professor John Torpe. is a professor of uh, sociology and uh, history and uh, director at the Institute for International Studies at the Graduate Center at New York. His uh, research explores uh, the intersections between politics, identity, and citizenship. He published uh, several books, uh, um, and uh, now I mention just uh, one of them, The Invention of uh, the Passport, Surveillance, Citizenship, and the State, by Cambridge University Press. His paper today is entitled uh, From Civil Right to Contemporary Citizenship, Immigration, ethno-racial difference, and inequality in today's America. Flat place to put my water. So it's very nice to be back in the American Academy in Rome. I don't have to persuade anybody of that. I'm confident. Um, and uh, the last time I was here, at least for an overnight, 
um, I was working on a book that was just mentioned, because uh, I was actually doing the research for that, perhaps oddly, in the library of the Chamber of Deputies down in downtown Rome. And I was fortunate enough to be uh, invited, despite not being a proper humanist, um, you know, to stay here for rent, of course, but uh, it was still a very nice place to be. And, and Marla happened to be here at that time as the holder of the Rome Prize. So what goes around comes around, I guess. Um, so uh, what I want to talk about today is really very much kind of at a preliminary stage. Uh, it's going to be a tough act to follow these two, you know, very substantial, significant papers. Um, my immediate sort of interest in the things that I'll talk about today is the upcoming and in all, in all almost certainty, the striking down of affirmative action in higher education admissions in the United States. So that has prompted me to teach a class about meritocracy and what that means. And, um, you know, in the, in the context of that uh, development to try to get a clearer picture of the history and development basically of the American population and the nature of ethno-racial inequality in the United States and uh, of course the, the role of class, which I think is often left out of these discussions uh, uh, on, to, our, you know, to our peril. Um, I wanna start with a little um, story that is found on, a, on the wall of the Ellis Island facility that processed so many immigrants. Uh, and it has an Italian connection, so I thought it was especially appropriate. There uh, seems to be an Italian uh, worker, you know, not a well-heeled person, uh, who says, I came to America because I heard the streets were paved with gold. When I got here, I realized three things. The streets were not paved with gold. The streets were not paved at all. And I was expected to pave them. <laughs> So, you know, he's probably a paving mogul now, but um, in any case, you know, the history of immigration in the United States is often, I think, a happier one than some of the things that Sylvana uh, referred to. Um, so I've decided uh, that I need to go back and look at this from, you know, the early beginnings of the United States. For those of you who are familiar with Alexis de Tocqueville's you know, incomparable book, uh, Democracy in America, still, you know, referred to all the time as, a, as insightful about the country, even though it's approaching 200 years old. Um, he had a long chapter in the first volume that came out in 1835, a chapter called uh, The Three Races That Inhabit America, right? So think, I mean, it's already obvious that that's completely out of touch with the world that we live in today. And that's kind of what I want to uh, sort of review. Um, as Tocqueville predicted, the numbers of Native Americans would decline as a result basically of warfare and the uh, expropriation of their lands. Um, and of course, in the second half of the 19th century, for those of you who may not be so familiar with this history, uh, beginning essentially in, in 1880, um, you have an expansion of the sources, the, the immigrant flows are coming from, to the United States now increasingly from Southern and Eastern Europe. They're Poles, they're Hungarians, they're Serbs, and they're Jews. And so uh, I know uh, Sylvana didn't mean this, I think, too seriously about the United States being a Protestant country. Of course, originally that was basically true in the sort of founding of the country. But over the course of these waves of immigration, that has changed very dramatically. Um, Asians, uh, almost entirely Chinese, began to arrive in the mid-19th century, but were confined largely to the West, the West Coast and the interior West, where they worked in agriculture, mining, and uh, building the railroads. The Chinese, whose immigration was largely cut off after 1880, gradually spread throughout the country, but were largely confined to Chinatowns where these existed. Uh, the Japanese um, remained largely a West Coast population and were, of course, eventually, uh, during World War II, subject to so-called internment, essentially imprisonment in prison camps, uh, because they were feared to be a fifth column for the Japanese uh, empire. Um, 
meanwhile, Asians were largely excluded before World War I in considerable part because they were regarded as ineligible for, citizen, for naturalization, and that was uh, grounds for uh, excluding them. Um, meanwhile, the waves of Southern and Eastern Europeans, including Italians who came after 1880, was cut off with the so-called national origins quotas of the 1920s. So you have this massive period of immigration so that the percentage of the American population that's foreign born is something like 13%, a number that we've only recently uh, come to replicate with, but with very different populations, of course. Um, and the result of those uh, early 1920s laws was a sharp drop, drop off in legal immigration. Uh, that would last about uh, 40 years. The black population in the United States, meanwhile, remained until the 20th century almost entirely in the South, uh, whether involuntarily, of course, uh, uh, under slavery, or after the Civil War, out of familiarity and habit. Yet the first half of the 20th century and the mechanization of Southern agriculture saw the, the so-called Great Migration of African Americans in, into the burgeoning industrial north. And by the end of World War II, as a result, the black population is increasingly a national population rather than chiefly a, a regional one that is, uh, of course, concentrated in the South. And in the process, the problem of racial equality increasingly took center stage in American politics and American life. Um, the attention to racial inequality was, I think, it's important to say, a, a sort of a local instance of the process of decolonization that uh, was taking place worldwide at the time. Um, concern about racial inequality was a product of the Cold War, was also a product of the Cold War rivalry between the U U.S. and the USSR. Uh, as some of you will surely be familiar, um, the, U the USSR got uh, you know, points for criticizing the United States for its racial inequalities and racial domination. So this was uh, a problem that began to get the attention of foreign policy leaders in the United States and something they felt the need to do something about. Um, the civil rights movement of the, of the 50s and 60s would soon challenge and in significant, significant respects transform uh, the structure of ethno-racial inequality in the U.S., and it did so, I think, in two fundamental ways. First, by guaranteeing, if not actually affording, equal rights to black people, the central racial group whose fortunes were to be improved by the protests. And second, the uh, Immigration and Nationalities Act, otherwise known as the Hart Seller Act for the uh, legislators who drafted it, um, precipitated the elimination of those national origins quotas of the 1920s. And it also ended policies that had kept Asians out of, out of the country by and large as well. And so in effect, with the adoption of this uh, Immigration and National Nationality Act of 1965, the United States was in a position now, essentially, where it was accepting potential immigrants from anywhere in the world. And there were two main criteria that you know, uh, made you eligible for uh, immigration under, those, under that law. And those were the possession of sought after skills or um, basically family unification, family reunification. If you had somebody already in the country, you know, that became a, a way for you to justify coming in. There was always a, a, a green card lottery, which is a relatively small part of the immigrant flow, and uh, refugees and asylees are another relatively small portion of the total, uh, but aren't, strictly, sp strictly speaking, immigrants. They're coming in under international legal sorts of arrangements. Um, so it was widely assumed at the time that this 1965 law would essentially rejuvenate the flows of immigrants from Europe. And of course, that turns out to be massively wrong <laughs> in totally unexpected ways. Uh, and what really happens, in fact, is that the numbers of people coming from south of the border grow dramatically, along with the numbers of people coming from Asia. So that you have a situation now in the United States where you know, Mexicans are by far the largest population of those who are foreign born in the American population. Uh, 
But the second uh, largest group, and I just really recently found this out and I'm still kind of amazed by it, is uh, Asian Indians are the, are the second largest group of foreign born uh, people in the United States today. So, I mean, this had major has had major consequences for you know our understanding of immigration and race and ethnicity, um, and you know Asians in particular. Many of you again will be surely know that you know Asians have been transformed from this population that was thought to be unassimilable, a yellow peril, um, you know, sort of not us, um, and now are seen in fact as. Uh, a so-called model minority, right? This is a population that is especially good at, you know, academic work and, and things like that. And, um, you know, meanwhile, the U.S. black population would gradually begin to include significant numbers of people with roots outside the United States, at least, you know, most directly. That is, uh, they came with roots ultimately in Africa, but, uh, now from Sub-Saharan Africa and, and the Caribbean. So needless to say, I mean, after 1965, um, the United States was a long way from the population with only uh, three races that Tocqueville wrote about in the early 19th century. It's become really dramatically a different place. Um, and aside from transforming the ethno-racial character of the po population, the civil rights movement also promoted greater economic equality, especially for blacks who were, again, you know, the main target of civil rights activism. I mean, King was a socialist who was an interracial activist. I mean, what he was exactly doing is not, you know, I think specifically uh, completely encapsulated in uh, his orientation to improvement for the black population. But of course, that was really, in many ways, the central issue. For historical reasons relating to the history of slavery and legal segregation, the civil rights movement focused chiefly, but by no means exclusively, on improving the lives of black people, uh, who were then the largest category of non-whites uh, in the United States. Uh, and it did so perhaps most visibly by way of this policy of, of what we call affirmative action, uh, which had complicated origins that weren't necessarily exactly oriented to the way we think about it now, but, um, and this was meant to, to address the systemic racism against the black community. And over time, it's come to focus on, uh, in, on increasing racial div diversity in higher education and in labor markets and in hiring, in other words. Um, and I think a real kind of watershed here in all this was again in 1965 when uh, L Lyndon Baines Johnson, the president, gave uh, a sort of mem memorable commencement speech at Howard University in which he basically said you can't, you know, sort of free someone but leave them essentially hobbled uh, with all kinds of disadvantages at the, you know, starting line of the race. You have to do something to you know, affirmatively uh, give them uh, an opportunity to start the race on an even, you know, from an even position. Um, and that was, I think, a huge kind of watershed in people's thinking. Then, of course, came, you know, riots in many cities in the later 60s and uh, the Kerner Commission report, which famously sort of decided or uh, described the United States as, you know, one society with, that was separate and unequal. Now, why it, why it said that was something that was new, I couldn't quite figure out because that was what Brown versus Board of Education in uh, 1954 was supposed to overcome, but clearly had not. And um, the Kerner Commission was, the Kerner Commission report was, you know, a huge landmark in U.S. governmental recognition of the inequalities faced by black people and the responsibility of whites for the circumstances in which uh, black people found themselves basically in you know, what were then referred to as the ghettos. Uh, so uh, in the meantime, I mean, the transformation of the American population that I've described briefly uh, resulting from the 1965 changes in immigration law um, have seriously complicated the picture that we're talking about in terms of ethno-racial inequality and how to address it. And now it you know, raises the question whether or not all non-whites, 
should benefit from affirmative action policies, which is the way that they've come to be implemented uh, across the country. Uh, and it's widely said today, as a result, that the American ethno-racial structure is one of white supremacy. Um, the dividing line is, in other words, conceived of as whites over uh, non-whites, or sometimes called BIPOC, black indigenous people of color. Uh, I would be inclined to argue myself that it's closer to a sort of black versus non-black situation that, uh, than it is to a white versus non-white. <laughs> Uh, structure. Um, that is to say, you know, particularly insofar as we're talking about immigrants, immigrants do pretty well in the United States. But there's a real, there's a huge issue about the selectivity of who comes, who chooses to leave their own countries. And then, of course, more, uh, more significantly even, you know, how they're treated at, at the border, who's allowed in. And I've already described the uh, you know, the criteria that are used uh, and, you know, uh, sort of training in particular skills is an important one. And that has tended to, you know, produce an Asian population in the United States, an Asian origin population that is, you know, relatively much better off than the average American and then these other uh, ethno-racial groups. So you have a situation in which um, Chinese and Indians are, I mean, Asian Chinese and Asian, Asian Indians are disproportionately well-educated compared both to the US population that they arrive into and from the population that they've left behind. So they're you know, more educated than the average Indian or the average Chinese, as well as you know, more educated than the average um, American. So that has tended to produce a population that is, you know, comparatively speaking, very well off in American terms. And indeed, Indians, uh, Asian Indians, have the highest median family income in the United States of all ethno-racial groups. Um, and, you know, this sort of situation is uh, complicating, I think, particularly the issue of, uh, uh, of uh, affirmative action in higher education. Because now basically have this situation in which Asians, uh, and typically I think when people use the term Asians, they really, they're sort of meaning East Asians, but that's not, we have to disentangle, we have to decompose this category of Asians, which was used or, or harks back to a period when there were relatively few Asians in the country. And that seemed like, you know, an adequate characterization of who we were talking about. But those numbers are now, you know, rising. The number of Asians coming into the United States is, is the fastest growing uh, group coming into the United States. So I think we have to sort of increasingly break these things down in order to understand what's really going on. Um, so I think what essentially has happened in the, uh, the Supreme Court cases that may or may not be familiar, but Harvard is, Harvard and the University of North Carolina are being sued by a, a group that is opposed to affirmative action. And uh, the Supreme Court has heard these oral arguments about the cases. And we're now waiting to hear what they're gonna say about uh, whether you can use uh, race as a factor in admissions decisions for higher education. Um, I, I, think, I don't know anybody who doesn't think they're going to essentially strike it down, but what exactly that will mean remains to be seen. And so what, I mean, what heretofore has been the case is that there's a, a so-called diversity rationale affirmative action, which makes the argument going back to a court case from 1978 that um, everyone you know, will benefit from a more diverse uh, population. Now, what that really means is you know, ethno-racial diversity. Other kinds of diversity, like geographical diversity, were invented in the early to mid 20th century to keep Jews out of places like Harvard and Yale, okay? So, um, you know, but now this, this means, I think, clearly something else. Um, so the question I think is going to be what's going to happen uh, in terms of our understanding of you know, how we're going to produce a diverse population, what that exactly means uh, after these uh, Supreme Court decision or this, it's now a combined pair of cases. 
Um, I mean, the other problem with affirmative action is that it's pretty unpopular in the country as a whole. And so uh, on the one hand, you have a, you know, already a sort of overrepresentation of Asians in elite uh, higher education. Um, and you also have this problem that it's basically an unpopular policy. And so I think the question is going to be, how are we going to re, you know, redo uh, affirmative action in such a way that it you know, meet, meets with the courts, uh, what, what's acceptable to the court, and will achieve these um, you know, goals of equality, basically. And um, you know, that's, I think, going to be a very complicated problem. There's all kinds of indications that uh, admissions officers in institutions of higher education are sort of gaming out what they're going to do. But you know, as I say, everybody thinks this is probably going to go by the boards. Um, so I mean, one of the problems is that um, you know, with the push towards meritocracy in the last two, three generations, um, that has tended to promote, you know, strictly academic criteria for judgment when it comes to uh, to uh, admissions decisions. So grades and mm -hmm. grades and test scores. Um, but you know, certain groups do less well on those kinds of measures, and so there's a push and there's a debate in you know higher education, selective public high schools, and that sort of thing. To, um, uh, to make these decisions on other grounds. And of course, the question is going to be, you know, on what grounds will be acceptable to the court and will help achieve these goals of racial and other class inequality, or class equality, sorry. So let me leave it there and thank you for uh, helping me think about this, I think, hugely con consequential problem. Thank you very much. Now we have uh, 15 minutes uh, for uh, questions and uh, remark. So feel free uh, to ask a question. Okay, I see two questions. And I have a question for Silvana. Um, so it's interesting what, what you were saying about uh, Don Yonki and you know the idea that these Mulatini, this plan to remove them from sight, like send them to uh, send them to a place like Brazil. Um, and I'm thinking about at the same time period, the 1950s. There's this kind of baby boom in trusteeship Somalia, um, a bit, uh, with Italian fathers and Somali women. And there, many of those children were actually sent ultimately to to Italy, right, um, to religious institutions. So in fact, they became visible. And I'm wondering why you think there's this difference. Um, and maybe it has something to do with the patrilineal bias in, in the citizenship code. And this was also a question for Angelica, because it's interesting to think about the role of the woman as the reproducer of the nation. And yet, you, you can have. Um, there's much stricter rules if you have your descent through an Italian mother or grandmother. There's a date, I think it's uh, the 10th of June, 1940, something, you know, it's like the time that Italy entered World War II, whereas it's more open-ended, the ancestry on the father's side. And so I'm just wondering about, like, you know, this, this, this very differential treatment in the cases of what you're talking about, Silvana, these populations of mixed-race children, and then how gender figures in story. Um. Yeah, this is actually something that was studied uh, recently. There was an article by Antonio Morone on the way in which the children who were born in uh, uh, Somalia under the trust ship in uh, the 1950s, who were actually taken to Italy, suffered from similar right, marginalization uh, as the children who were born in Italy. So. Uh, it, it may be something that has to do with this kind of return to uh, the uh, patrilineal, to the um, prerogative of the male, right, before the introduction of uh, the uh, racist legislation by the fascists. So when, right, Italian men who had uh, relationships with uh, um, women in, uh, in the colonies, uh, right, were able to recognize their children, right? So. And in some cases, there are this, uh, there's a role of uh, this kind of um, 
religious institutions in the corner for, uh, co uh, colonies and former colonies, uh, which had, uh, uh, as in other, you know, uh, colonial uh, situations uh, uh, dominated by other countries, had this kind of role of uh, sort of rescuing, right, the children who were sort of mixed race, right, and they wanted to sort of make sure that because there was that component of whiteness in them, they would be, you know, educated to become fully Italians or fully French and taken away from the streets if they were abandoned, right? It has to do a lot with, the, again, the idea of the prestige, maintaining the prestige of the race, even in the case of mixed race, right? I mean, so it has a lot to do with the politics and the role of these institutions in that thing. So that doesn't really sort of uh, um, weaken the argument that color, that sort of so-called race, meant a lot in, you know, uh, in the way that people experienced or the way people were treated in Italy. But of course, there are these kind of distinctions to be made. And if we go back, right, to, if we look at the uh, sort of trajectory, right, of all the legislation and the ideas about the mixed race uh, over a longer period of time, right, there are some, you know, there is some kind of maybe a return to the pre-fascist uh, legislation in the way in which these populations were managed, these groups were managed, I think. Yeah, no, in terms of gender, it's interesting because if we think about Fatamato, I mean, mm -hmm. interracial relationships were kind of tolerated until 1937, and it was taken for granted with Italian men, having sex with an African woman. But we also have cases of Italian women having relationship with Eritrean men, and, and because of being the reproducer of the nation, that was particularly stigmatized, because obviously the nation is reproduced through the war. <laughs> so that's why uh, those kind of relationships were really dangerous, because then you were giving birth to mixed-race babies. And uh, yes, by the law, they were Italian. Um, so by blood, they were Italians for patrilineal um, codes, but they were still black. And so that's why uh, for women was, um, for a number of reasons, was much more difficult to have interracial relationship with African men. Concerted attacks on black academics, on teaching of black history. And, you know, this is taking place in a kind of transnational uh, right wing uh, moment, right, where, you know, Steve Bannon is friendship with the SLP. So I was just kind of thinking about thinking through mm -hmm. these ways in which these knowledge politics are kind of at work um, in these kind of distinct sites. There, what you see is there's kind of similarities. Sorry. <laughs> Apologize. Um, yes, um, it's, it's what we were saying earlier also at, at lunch. Um, what I was trying to show, <coughs> we always think about the right wing, right? Without focusing on the left wing and the damages they do. And so, in a way, there is this cooptation of right wing discourses badly performed because they're not capable to do it as good as the right. And so, yeah, there are this contra also these controversial um, uh, kind of uh, erasure, as, as you were saying. Uh, thinking about this morning, Stephanie's lecture, when she was talking about camps and Roma, um, at the time, uh, we had in Rome a, a left-wing mayor, Beltroni, who was even worse than Berlusconi in, in terms of discourse and legislation. So I think, um, yes, and, and then we we have, yes, this banning of critical race studies <coughs> and uh, um, what you were saying about affirmative action, but uh, so there, are, there are some struggles there, I think. So these contradictions are very, are very interesting. So 
I mean, I'm intrigued by your question and, you know, by the points that were made about the kind of international character. And, you know, I, I don't know a, a lot about it, I don't think, but uh, uh, one person who might be crucial, and maybe more crucial than Stephen Bannon, is this guy, Christopher Rufo. Christopher Rufo is uh, Ron DeSantis' wingman on the transformation of this small college called New College. Um, is, is it on? Yes. So uh, Ron DeSantis is the governor of Florida, and Ron DeSantis is you know, planning to become the next president by fighting culture wars. And um, so, and he's doing that with the, you know, assistance, well-informed assistance of uh, a guy named Christopher Rufo, who comes out of a uh, left-wing Italian family. His parents were immigrants, or at least one of them was an immigrant, and, you know, they were good, I don't know if they were communists exactly, but they were leftists in, back here in Italy. And so he knows what he's talking about when he says, you know, these critical race theory people are you know, using Gramsci to try to take over the American mind. And, um, you know, it all goes back to Edmonia, right? I mean, he, so he knows all this. And he's a very, actually, I think, very smart guy and very, he's a, he's a bomb thrower, I mean, figuratively. <laughs> but um, that's, I, th I think he's a major figure in, you know, he, he's the guy who said critical race theory we on the right are going to make that, you know, it's a piece of flypaper that anything will stick to. Socialism, you know, this, that, and the other thing. Uh, gender ideology, all these things. Um, and so he's a guy to watch. I mean, uh, Bannon's probably better known, probably has more money at his uh, beck and call, sort of. But Christopher Rufo is, um, is an ideological thinker who's, Who's, who's at something called the Manhattan Institute, which despite its associations with that, uh, sometimes referred to as an island off the coast of Europe, um, uh, you know, it's a conservative think tank, basically, and full of smart people, I would say. So watch the Manhattan Institute. Yeah, and I think generally, so this question of uh, the sort of anti-racism of the left is right is a big problem. First of all, because the left is almost gone, so there is no more of it. Because if you think about what happened in Italy, is the sort of suicide of the PCI in 1990, 1991. So what is left? What was left of it were sort of, sort of marginal groups on the left, and the others sort of embraced essentially neoliberal sort of ideas, right? And also the there's never been a big tradition of anti-racism in Italy in the sense that uh, when they started to sort of, so, uh, so the solidarity, right, there is the solidarity, there is third worldism in Italy, there is solidarity with anti-colonial movements, but what you um, do not have is a kind of uh, self-sustaining and, uh, and deep uh, sort of analysis of what racism means. So there's never been any sort of real thinking, right, until uh, recent years about colonial racism, for example, right? So that was like a erasure completely. It was a very selective memory of that uh, episode. And when you picked up some sort of anti-racism in the 60s and 70s, it was sort of very, very much uh, sort of borrowed some ideas from the US, so doing nothing as having to do with um, affirmative action, but it was a kind of universalist discourse, right? Um, uh, so it was not sort of, uh, uh, identity based or, or, or race based uh, um, uh, anti racism, but it was really in this kind of very uh, universal terms. And uh, essentially, when this, if we try to do a sort of periodization, then we have to wait until the for a movement, for an anti racist movement among Italians until the, the end of the 80s, right? When there is finally this big demonstration uh, against. Uh, after the, the death, uh, the killing of uh, Jerry Manslow um, in uh, near Naples, uh, so this worker from South Africa who had not been able to get to refugee status and was working in this very exploitative uh, uh, field uh, in the South. Um, and so, but e even then, there's never been a sort of de a development of a very strong movement, so we have to sort of wait until the really, so the, the second generations and so on picked up 
the struggle. Uh, but it's been, um, yeah, it's, it, has, it is a history that still has to be written, but clearly it's not, uh, right? There's not been a, a very strong reaction over the years. Uh, and the, um, and again, the, the sort of the center left, the sort of centrist left has always been, uh, as in other countries, also been uh, uh, hegemonized really by the discourse of the, of the right and these themes. So, so they provide a kind of a sort of light right wing kind of discourse, but that's that's what it is. I mean, it doesn't have the courage. It's just uh, sort of, they always think that political is not paying. Uh, and so there is not, you know, very few people that are able to stand up on principles. So they just go and sell out uh, major, in a major way. So this is, this is a real issue. Yes, so now we have just a few minutes remaining. So if there are any, a question uh, uh, so the first one is uh, for uh, um, so um, I would like to ask you to elaborate more about uh, the um, uh, controversial fi figure of uh, Giorgia Meloni uh, since uh, she is uh, presenting herself uh, as an Italian mother as we saw but uh, in the meanwhile, she is uh, also uh, exhibiting uh, her uh, role, this leading role, since it is the first time that a woman has uh, is covering this role. So can you elaborate more on this uh, ambivalence? <coughs> the second question uh, is more general. I would like to ask uh, um, you focus uh, both uh, um, Silvana Patriarca and Angelica, Pes Angelica Pesarini, you focus uh, on um, the public uh, discourse uh, more. And uh, I would like to ask uh, um, how is developing uh, the counter discourse on uh, uh, national and race uh, in contemporary Italy, also through activism on the other uh, different uh, uh, sides from the public uh, institution. We collect another question. I don't see. Ah, oh, there is another one. My question also relates to gender. Actually, and Angelica, thank you for showing us Georgia Meloni's white male rage. Um, <laughs> made me think of you know Anne Tickner's theory about how female leaders on the world stage adopt these masculine characteristics that essentially can disavow their gender. But I was wondering if maybe you could talk a little bit about. It. Angelia, specifically with your paper, the story of beauty and, and her death. And to me, it brought to mind not just necropolitics, but this idea of the politics of care, right? And it's reinforcing this idea that I had mentioned in the talk of like, oh, here, we give you some care, but you know, it's actually reinforcing the status quo and the inequalities of power relations. And recently, Sandra Lagier published a book um, the politics of care, in which she says care, because it's feminized and it's domestic, is deemed an, uh, is deemed not worthy, actually, uh, an object of intellectual research. And I was wondering if we could talk a little bit more about this idea of care and the way that the academic subjects become feminized in some sense, then get this about and put aside. Thank you for, for, for this question. So I try to respond collectively. Um, yes, the, 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 the ambivalent uh, use of uh, gender performativity, I would say, of, of Meloni is quite, uh, is quite obvious. So on, on the one hand, she's a mother, she's a woman. So there is a, a, a very strong emphasis on the idea of maternity. And a certain age, because people will say, wow, finally we have a woman leading the country doesn't mean, <laughs> being women doesn't mean to be feminist. So there was this association of her to be uh, progressive, to be a feminist. And as you were saying, she 
co-opted a lot of masculinized way of being a politician. So I think it's very smart the use, uh, the shift she does in terms of gender. Uh, so being very uh, protective women, uh, but also having, you've seen, I think this, when she speaks, she's so, <laughs> Yeah, doesn't reflect that side of uh, femininity that she would like to to defend. Um, the story of beauty, yes, I was a bit in a hurry, but that story for me was really important because it happened in February 2018, and in another paper I wrote about that in comparison to Pamela Mastro Pietro. So we had this shooting, and uh, this terrorist Luca Traini shot black people in Macerata to avenge uh, the, the death of uh, Pamela Mastro Pietro. So there was all this media attention, this girl on this young woman who was 18 year old, she was heroin addict and uh, she was portrayed in a very uh, infantilized way. Uh, I remember reading she was a slave of her uh, disorder. Uh, uh, she was a slave of drugs, so uh, completely incapable of taking decisions. And then there is this other woman uh, who is African, who is pregnant, but she's also sick. So she, she was uh, at the end of this terminal disease. And her body is racialized in a completely different way. Uh, so La Russa was going on and saying, these women cannot have babies in Italy because they're going to uh, destroy the, the purity of our nation. And so, what I was interested in was to show how women's body is gendered and racialized in a specific way to build a specific national discourse and nationalistic discourse that is really carved on our bodies. But it's very extractive too. So also this opportunistic use of, of, of women's body. And also, yes, the, 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 the politics of care. So certain women, also if we think about uh, jobs, how, Domestic work, care work is very ethnicized and feminized, and so uh, women of a certain shade uh, are seen in a certain way. So not too dark, because that is sex worker, mm -hmm. but the brown shade then can be, yeah, badante, nannies, um, and so how we expect certain care <coughs> for, from certain types of body that we define in a certain way. Um, yes. Yeah, so you had a question about sort of counter discourse. Uh, oh, in, counter discourse. Right. Yeah, sorry, I forgot that. It's very important. Uh, counter discourse is there is a lot going on. There is a lot going on at the moment in Italy in terms of anti racist discourse produced by racialized subjects. So, this I think is really the difference that we are witnessing now. Uh, so, finally, it's not anymore white uh, Italians talking about race and racism, but finally, we have people of color who um, they've been doing this for a while, of course, but I think in the past two, three years, we really had a shift. And so there is this intention to reclaim our spaces, to reclaim our voices, to get organized. Uh, we recently formed an anti-racist co um, coordinamento that is composed only by racialized Italians. Uh, so there is a lot, a lot going on, yes. Yeah, so I was, I was thinking about all these pub the publications that are taking, you know, I mean, there's been a production of uh, literature by uh, Afro-Italians and by others, uh, um, so um, so so it it has to come from it has to come it's coming from from that uh, <coughs> thing and I think that white Italians uh, like myself we have to learn from that I mean there is not enough I mean there is always the kind of uh, idea that um, you know we we are defining what racism is right but it's not you know, people who are racialized who are the targets of this have to define it and that have to uh, they have to they are teaching now. Italians, so there has to be, um, right, uh, it, it's important to listen to that, which is what many Italians don't want to do, right? Mm -hmm. they, they are sort of always starting with the thing, we, we know what it is, right? We're defining, no, that's, that's enough. So I think that there is right now the voice that is coming out much more, right, than in previous year. And there are certain publishers who are sort of willing to, to publish this. I mean, there is a, quite, a, quite an interesting mm -hmm. large it's production of also, you know, not only sort of secondary sort of publishers, but also others. Yeah. So 
Yeah. I, I hope an impact. Yeah, yeah, the risk is also this kind of tokenization, though. So now everyone wants to publish uh, novels or books written by black Italians. So there is also this uh, side of the coin mm -hmm. that is, yeah, let's have black artists, Afro-Italian artists are in huge demand now. So we also have to be careful about this tokenization mm -hmm. that sometimes in, involve us. But I think, yes, uh, having these books published is also a massive uh, uh, achievement. <coughs> Yeah. Great. Before we thank our three panelists, I just want to say we have tea and coffee and cookies upstairs for everyone uh, present right now. And then I would ask the conference participants to stay back a minute. We're going to take a group picture. Uh, but so a huge thank you to our terrific panel. And to, and to our chair, Carmen. And um, let's try to come back in 15, 17 minutes. At the beginning, when there was the National Front and that 60s, in the early 70s, there were some.